Hey there, my fellow base builders, Rodamon here. Thank you for tuning in to Rad's Guide to Project Zomboid. Episode 3, Choosing a Base. So there is a group right outside of the church. But if I sneak around here, maybe they won't see me. That's locked. And just a plastic bag. So I'm going to demonstrate noise um, purposefully. So I'm going to right click on this window here. And a really good way to accurately destroy the window that you intend is to interact with the hood here. I can see that this car is out of gas. It has pretty terrible tires. It's not going to be one that I want to drive. And I can right click on the right front window and just say smash window. And make sure to be holding a weapon that you can smash with. Now, unlike house windows, car windows don't have broken glass. I know, it's weird. Car windows don't have broken glass. So as soon as you smash a car's window, it's like safe to interact with. You can hop in the car, it's no problem. If you smash a house's window, you have to remove the glass to make it safe for you to go through. So now I've smashed that window. Surprisingly, these zombies didn't hear it. So I'm going to go inside. So the reason to smash windows here is just to check to see if there's like keys or whatever. Because you can always replace a window. And I chose to smash the passenger side so that if I was driving this vehicle, I would still be protected by the driver's side window. And then you can hit um, V for the vehicle context menu or Z to just have the seats overlay. And I can switch to the driver's seat, which allows me to unlock the doors here. So now the doors of this entire vehicle are unlocked. So if I did uh, want to hotwire this car, now, you know, the doors are unlocked. And, and this is the same place if the trunk was locked, you can un unlock the trunk. All right, let's go into this house because there's two cars parked outside and see if there's keys in here. And that thunk is an indicator that this window will never be uh, forced open. So I can pick a new window. Now there's a small chance that um, buildings have security systems that are alarmed. And if that's the case, that would be a use case for sprinting. Wow, I really worked hard to force that one open. So if you end up tripping um, a house alarm or a car alarm for that matter, get away from the sound because it's going to draw every zombie within two blocks to your location and you will have a swarm on your hands in no time. Uh, so this is an engineer magazine. So for these magazines, the books, and if you're wondering why I didn't read these books, books take like an, like the better part of a day to read start to finish. Whereas magazines only take you a few minutes. So if you happen upon a magazine that offers you a skill, like the one I'm currently reading, um, it's worth just like reading it and putting it aside. You can hold on to it if you'd like. Uh, but this one is uh, to make noisemakers. And then if I mouse over it, as you can see, I've already read it. Things that offer you skills or something will have the context of already read. Um, and then talking about skills in general, the best way to level up uh, skills in this game, the fastest way, is to read the book and then watch the tape. So let me open up this tracker again. Uh, all of the crafting skills of correlated um, tapes so and, and books. So you have carpentry, cooking, electrical, farming. I mean, you can read the rest. And there are different skill levels to each book, one through five. So right now, my crafting skill on the bottom left here is zero. I don't have any crafting skills to anything. So the only books that I can handle without any experience is level one books. Um, each book will give you two levels to a skill. So if I read a carpentry book, carpentry volume one, I would level up my carpentry skill from level zero to level two fast. And then as soon as I hit level two, I would need to read the second volume. So there are, for each crafting skill, there are 10 levels. 
And those 10 levels are divided between five books, volumes one through five. Um, so if you're trying to level up your skills, the fastest way is to read books first so that you get bonus experience. It's basically just a bonus modifier. The second way is to watch tapes. So as you see right here, this column, this column is all of the tapes that exist in the game. I have them sorted as tapes and rare tapes. Don't worry so much about the rare tapes column because the rare tapes you're really not going to find very often. I just have them included because if you do happen to find them, they're very useful. The regular tapes are way easier to find specifically cooks one through seven, wood one through seven and survival one through eight and car zone one through three. Uh, if you go to VHS stores in the game, you will typically find a smattering of these tapes. And the best way, there, there are a few different ways to level up. So in the first approximately a week, the these skill tapes, the cook, wood, and survival, will be running on the television. And you can, if you'd like, sit on the couch and watch them as they air. I don't do that, however. Because it usually means that you're just a couch potato for the first, like, week of the game, which is just not fun and quite boring. So, despite the fact that it would impart a decent amount of experience, it's not something I do. Also, if you're new to the game, it's not helpful. Because crafting skills don't really keep you alive that much. Your combat skills do. Uh, so, if you're brand new to the game or you're new-ish, don't bother sitting through the uh television broadcasts because you can find the associated tapes for those television broadcasts later on and benefit them greater so there, there, there's a weird result of this whereas if i for instance watch if i read a cookbook volume one and then watch the associated tape or television broadcast of cooking there will be even more experience gained so there is sort of two versions of the meta for leveling up your uh, cooking, woodworking, and survival skills. So those survival tapes, let me bring that back up, um, correlate to different things. So some of those survival tapes are for foraging, fishing, and trapping, and then some of them are actually just for woodwork as well. Uh, so leveling up your, your carpentry, your cooking, your foraging, fishing, and, and trapping skills you can either sit through the television broadcasts while trying to read the books, or you can collect the books and then read them and then collect the tapes and watch them. And I'd like to do that second option because it allows you to do it on your own time. It doesn't tie you up for a week. Um, so I just figured I'd mention that now that I'm finding things that are relevant. So here's a foraging book. And for, for that reason, I am not going to be collecting anything other than volume one. I only initially will need volume one of every book. So I'm not going to weigh myself down grabbing cooking volume three. Um, this is particularly useful for new players because you might not even survive long enough to use volume three. So all it's doing is weighing you down and you're not benefiting from it. So, so why do that? Um, and then some skills, like I said before, are just very hard to level up. So first aid is one that comes to mind. Um, it's very rare to even get to volume two of first aid or volume three of first aid. And the amount of players that get to volume five of first aid organically without like cheating or modding is like next to nil. Like almost no one gets that much first aid skill unless they're making a point to grind it by like cutting themselves with glass and patching themselves up over and over and over, which is just like weird. And why bother? Uh, so some books are just like, even if I had a giant library, they're barely worth collecting anyway, other than to be a collector. Also note that every single room here has the potential to have zombies in it. So I'm being very methodical about clearing each room so that it can't be jumped. And then um, there's an argument to be made of closing the doors behind you so you don't get ambushed. Or leaving the doors open so you know that people are coming. I could see it either way. Generally, I like to like close the front door. So if any zombies are like wandering in, they're slowed down. But the internal doors, I could definitely see the argument of just like leave them open and know that people are coming. 
But this is a relatively small building. So I am just clearing it now. I do have some curry weight for some additional canned goods, but I'm not even going to bother with it. I'm going to grab the processed cheese and the banana. Um, and also the peas, because the peas are currently frozen, but they will thaw and I'll be able to eat them without penalty. So eating thawed pe uh, frozen peas it imparts boredom and unhappiness. But letting them thaw out, which they will do over time, and then eating them will not have those penalties. So I'm just collecting for later, sticking to my backpack. And then before I leave here, I can go to the red color. Market is cleared. Um, on my map, there is this large green building to my northeast, and I'm going to want to work my way there. I didn't, however, in this building find any keys or uh, tools that I find useful. So I'm still sneaking. And as I said before, you can check if you're actually sneaking or not by like mousing over your sneaking skill as it will level up. As you can see, it's literally going up as I move around. Um, it will stop leveling up if I'm not close enough to zombies or if I'm revealed. So it's kind of hard to tell if... Uh, if I'm just far enough away from zombies that I'm not leveling up anymore, or if I'm revealed. But it is, like, oddly enough, like a zombie detector of sorts. But now I'm revealed. So let's clear it out. So there's an instance where I swung too soon. But because I quickly backpedaled, I put distance so that the zombie couldn't get me. And here's a, a good example of when to disengage, where I was trying to stomp and missed it. So he was standing back up, and it was dangerous for me to stay still. So I backed up, put some distance between the zombies, and reset for combat. Now, I am getting unpleasantly hot. Um, so I might want to take off even more clothing. But before I do that, I'm going to... Spin around to make sure nothing else is attracted to me um, before doing that. So I'll pause and let's consider. Um, my t-shirt doesn't really offer me any protection stats, so I'm just going to throw it away for now. The denim shirt and the leather jacket are doing the most protecting, so I'm going to leave those on. Um, and we'll see if I stop overheating with no t-shirt on. So I'm just wearing a denim shirt and a leather jacket. A little unpleasantly hot is not a problem as long as I have a source of water, which I do. And as you can see now that there's two downward green arrows on this moodlet, it means I'm cooling off. That the removal of that t-shirt um, was enough. Alright. This building here is a wide footprint two-story building. Right? I can see that it has two floors. And it's obviously very big. So. It would make, without even going inside, I can tell you right now, it would make for a pretty decent base because there's a lot of opportunities and directions to escape. Um, it also has a garage door here so that I can potentially drive into it and treat it like a garage. Um, my e experience in Rosewood will also tell you that, yes, this is one of the better base locations in Rosewood. Rosewood only has a few locations that I would even consider viable, um, and this is one of them. So we are going to want to clear out this large room. Clear out the large building to make it into a base. And clearing out buildings is rather dangerous because I said fighting indoors is more dangerous than fighting outdoors. Because indoors, there's a lot of blind corners and you can get ambushed, you can get trapped, you can get cornered. Um, this car just from visual glance, doesn't have a lot of body damage, so might be a pretty good vehicle to try to use. And it has a wrench inside. So a wrench is one of those tools that um, I typically try to, to grab. A wrench is useful for, um, for car maintenance and the like, so it is uh, one of those tools that I'll put in my backpack. And I already know what kind of building this is, but often um, 
The people around the building, some of the people around the building will have thematic clothing related to the building. So for instance, if you go near a police station, there'll be a lot of people dressed as cops. If you go near a firehouse, there'll be a lot of people dressed as firemen. And in this case, this is a grocery store. Uh, so that guy had an apron on. So he worked as like a grocer of sorts. So this hoodie um, is on par with the sweater that I uh, I have in my backpack, but it is damaged. So I'm going to leave it behind. Oh, vitamins. So vitamins in this game are a little weird. As you can see, bouncing over them, they reduce fatigue. They're kind of like energy pills. Um, so calling them vitamins is a little weird. They should be like trucker pills or energy pills. Uh, and they're very useful to use if you are trying to fight your way home or fight to somewhere safe and it's late at night and you're getting tired because being tired makes fighting very difficult. Uh, my two cents, coffee is better uh, because you need to throw back a whole lot of vitamins to keep your alertness up. Whereas like for a bat, if you had a bag of coffee, you could just eat like a half a bag of grounds and you'd be awake for the whole night. Um, but, but vitamins are good in a pinch. Also, eating dry coffee will make you thirsty, so if you're running low on water, that might not be as viable. And uh, if you're wondering about this apron here, uh, it will cover your upper, lower torso, and thighs, but it has zero native protection, uh, meaning that you would have to improve it with tailoring to make it worth anything. And that's not something I intend to do, so I'm gonna leave it there. So there's a few more zombies outside, and I don't, my personal preference is to clear the nearby area so that when I'm trying to open up doors, I don't have to watch my six. I don't really want the possibility of zombies to wander in on me as I'm like in a building. You will notice that my panic numbers are increasing, or my panic severity, with the moodlet in the top right um, a deeper color and blinking. And that's because I'm taking on more zombies than my character is comfortable with. And as I kill the zombies, the panic will go away. Now, as you can see, the panic is gone, because the zombies are dead. Uh, long sleeve shirt. I'm going to put that in my backpack. So the long sleeve shirt, if you're wondering, is just like that apron where um, it doesn't actually offer any protection. But if you sew, uh, if you sew strips of fabric into it, it can offer protection. So it's a good, it's a good canvas or a good uh, platform to tailor up better clothing. And long sleeve shirts and t-shirts um, take the same slot. And then I'll also wear a baseball cap because there's a chance that if I get attacked, it gets knocked off my head rather than um, rather than me take damage. Make sure there's no zombies hiding around the, the um, garbage cans. So the garbage bins also have a unique ability to just delete things. So here, in these large bins, uh, I have a delete all button, which just like deletes the things that are in them. So it's really good for trash cleanup um, because the way the game works is like corpses, especially corpses indoors, will start to rot and can make you sick. And, um, and if you're not careful and you're killing zombies in a building or whatever and you leave them there, you can get really ill really quickly. So bringing corpses out to like dumpsters and dumping them uh, can keep you alive. Alternatively, if you don't have a dumpster to buy, you can just like put them away from where you live. Uh, but but dumpsters permanently delete them from the game. There is um, cleanup, however. So corpses in this game will rot very, very quickly. And it's like a sort of memory cleanup so that the game runs better. Oh, that was another um, 
another sort of advanced strategy where if you quickly flick a door open and closed, it's not enough time for zombies to actually uh, approach you or attack you or anything. But it gives you, as long as you're quick about it, it gives you a vision into the room. Often, if you're like stealth or stanced or not making any noise or whatever, and you do it, they might not even notice you. Uh, and it's just a good way to like quickly check rooms. I don't do it very often. I usually just kind of bust in, which is not as good. But that would be an advanced strategy, especially if you're in hard difficulties where it's high pop or something and you have to be a lot more careful. You think they're uh, removing door flash in the upcoming update? I haven't really kept up on the upcoming update because it's been um, in progress for like two years now or something. Some ridiculous long time, so I haven't been reading all the updates. So this is my first map. Uh, the maps in the game will re reveal huge chunks of the world to you. And this is the Louisville map. So if I open up my big map here, this is the section of Louisville that is now revealed as a result of getting that uh, route map, which is downtown, middle Louisville with the park. The, because I'm in a grocery store, these boxes are just going to be full of food, which... Oh, and I have some company, which does have the advantage of me not having to actually forge for my own food if I make this a home. And then here's an instance where if you're in a building, and there are some exceptions to this, like um, like self-storage facilities, but generally speaking, if you find a key on someone in a building, it will unlock all of the locked doors in that building. So you remember how I tried to jimmy open this door here? Actually, this door might be, what is that, a laundromat or something? It might actually be a separate building entirely to the grocery store. But generally speaking, a key will open all the doors to, to the building. And the exception, of course, would be like self-storage and things like that, where they are separated into different sections. Um, so grabbing that key and sticking it in my key ring is going to be really handy if I happen upon any locked doors and I need to unlock them. And I'm also using the door here as a way to control traffic. If I consistently close the door, if there's a horde all of a sudden, at least I have a physical barrier between me and the horde. There are some additional orange soda bottles, and I'm going to pour them on the ground. So that I have... I don't want to do this once. I like to have two water bottles instead of just the one. Um, giving me a little bit more water capacity. Normally when I play, I play with a uh, high thirst trait on, which just makes it so that you have to drink more often, but it frees up points for other things. Also, uh, chips is pretty high calorie, uh, but they're pretty lightweight as well. So they're good to pack as just like, uh, man, I'm really hungry and I need to eat something kind of food. Um, whereas like gummy worms and gummy worms, you know, aren't going to fill you up in the same way. Uh, this is um, sacks of fresh, fresh vegetables. And if I, once this building is cleared out, uh, one really good thing to do with, and, and I'll talk about a little bit of the way food preservation works in this game, but one really good thing to do is to take all these sacks of, of vegetables and stick them in the freezer for later. Uh, so the way the game works is right at the start of the game, um, more or less everything is like everything that is in a uh, fridge or a refrigerator, uh, freezer or refrigerator is like fresh. And, uh, I'm going to make up some numbers just for educational purposes, but like, let's take a tomato. Let's say a tomato is good for a week. If you take a tomato that was fresh picked and immediately put in a refrigerator, it's going to, um, I believe, double its shelf life or whatever, double its rot timer. Uh, but if you take a tomato that is half rotten, let's say 3.5 days old and stick it in the refrigerator, you're only going to double the remaining time on it. So you're not going to get 14 days, you'll get seven. Um, if you freeze things, it's like a times four modifier. So if you don't want to have to forage for a lot of food or rely on canned goods and do a lot of cooking, because food in cans generally you can't really cook with, fresh produce you can cook with, and cooking 
can offer you the ability to um, make yourself happier and healthier or whatever. Uh, so taking fresh produce that you find on like shelves and stick it in the freezers will make it last a lot longer. And like specifically potatoes can last a very long time in freezers. There was one other like really advanced and this happens much later on a uh, way to preserve food, which is jarring things, but it's not very reliable because trying to find mason jars, vinegar and sugar so that you can jar um, foods is expensive. And honestly, quite frankly, it's just cheaper to continue to farm for fresh produce rather than to jar produce because farming is um, much lower effort than than scouting around for for mason jars and trying to jar things. Um, power and water will be cut. And one very useful thing to find is these water coolers because they're very high volume water containers. Um, you can also rely on things like um, like bathtubs and sinks, because even when the water's cut, there will be some remaining uh, water in sink basins and bathtubs and showers and the like. So this building, one of the advantages of this building is this large footprint, meaning that there's like a lot of storage and a lot of ways out of it so that you can escape. One of the disadvantages, of course, with this building is it is, um, it, it has a lot of visibility, it has these giant windows that are, um, going to allow zombies to see me. I don't want the zombies, if I can help it, breaking too many of these windows. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to round up these zombies and um, and kill them before they do too much damage to the windows themselves. I can always board up the windows, but it will help reduce uh, broken glass and uh, maintenance required. So offering them a way to get in and then killing the zombies are going to reduce the damage. I'm not going to be able to reduce it to zero. Because as you can see, these three zombies make real quick work of that glass pane. It's not zombie-proof glass. But the glass doors are a little bit more, um, a little bit more durable. In order to secure a building like this, as I said before, you're going to want to remove access to the second floor, which in the case, in my case, probably means finding a sledgehammer. But I can at least make it very difficult for zombies to get in by boarding up all the windows. And of course, this specific building has a tons of windows, so it's a bit of an undertaking. But um, investing in a permanent base like this one is going to pay off um, in the long run so that I have a good place to store all the things I rely upon for long-term survival. It's also becoming nighttime. So uh, that brings me to another important thing to do on day one, which is to find a relatively safe place to sleep. Um, you will never, the game, if you sleep somewhere dangerous, there's a possibility that you're woken up nose to nose by zombies and that will end your run really quickly. So, um, finding like a decently isolated place to sleep is a really good initial goal. All right. I am getting a little peckish, so I'll eat some slice of cheese like Homer Simpson. There's a lot of high calorie foods in this grocery store. It's going to make it really easy to keep weight. So before I start clearing the second floor of the grocery store and making sure the first floor is cleared, any zombies, because zombies, as you may have noticed, they like shuffle around and wander around a little bit. Any zombies that are a little bit too close to the building, I might as well kill now so that they're not drawn to the windows and doors to break it later on. This will help to prevent damage. This building in particular has a ton of external lights, as you can see. So it's very well lit from the outside, which is something that um, 
warehouses don't typically have. And then, where are the zombies broke? This window? I am going to remove the broken glass. And when you remove broken glass, make sure to have some sort of weapon in your hand. Because if you remove broken glass with your bare hands, you're very likely to hurt yourself. And then I also picked up, um... I also picked up the broken glass that was on the ground. And I can put that in the trash can and just delete it. So now that there is, now there isn't a broken glass threat for me. Uh, another important thing to note is this is an annotated map. So this is an annotated maps, and I know the stream is uh, family friendly. Sometimes the notes on these annotated maps are not family friendly, so a little little alert uh, there. But the annotated maps can show you um, important points of interest. So this one has a gift from mom. And from my experience, this is the cemetery of Louisville. So I, I know what it is. So this is, don't forget to visit grandma's grave if you can. Say a prayer for all, us all. And then there's some gift for mom. So these entertainment maps are useful if you want to go like treasure finding. You can think of them as treasure maps. And what I tend to like to do with them is when I read an entertainment map, um, I like to mark it down on my big map so that I can, uh, I have a collection of all the summary of the entertainment maps. Um, so I'll do this in blue. I'll put a little arrow there to the same building that it was annotating and then say uh, items with a question mark. Because it doesn't really specify what it is. Sometimes the annotated maps will say like guns or fuel or something like that. And other times they're a lot less descriptive and they're just like, eh, something's here. So I know that there's something maybe there, maybe not. Sometimes the annotated maps lead you nowhere. But often, often, they're pretty useful. And what we want to do here is to make sure the bottom floor is cleared so that I can ascend the stairs here to go upstairs and not have anything follow me up. So I am turning on all the lights so that there's no blind and there's no dark corners. Oh, here's an eraser. Erasers are also really handy to have. Erasers will let you remove marks from your map. Uh, so if you mismark something and you don't have an eraser, you're kind of stuck with it until you get one. So I had uh, that brand new orange bottle that I now just topped up in water, so I have twice as much water as I had before. Uh, padlocks are not something you really need to use on single player, but saws are useful tools, so I'll take the saw. Saws allow you to um, to break down wooden objects and, and um, make boards out of wood and things like that. Uh, don't drink bleach. Here I'd say it, but it's kind of obvious. Not good for you. Right, just poking my head out of here. Still no zombies out that way. And then, yes, this is a laundromat. Uh, laundromats can occasionally be good places to find, like, spare clothing, but usually the nicest clothing is not going to be found in these laundromats. Now, what you can find here are, like, things like sheets. Uh, I'll put these maps away. So, sheets can be used to cover up windows to remove visibility. Um... So sheets or curtains and things like that are often pretty good to collect if you're trying to build a base. Um, because until the windows and doors are fully or three-fourths boarded up, they offer visibility to the zombies. But alternatively, I can just add one sheet and remove visibility. Okay, I have... Secured the bottom floor, and I'm closing these doors so they can't be backfilled by zombies. Essentially, I don't want zombies going into areas that I have quote-unquote cleared and ambushing me in the future. Now, something that you might notice is you don't get vision of a floor until you, like, are fully up. Which can be pretty sketchy when you first ascend. Uh, there shouldn't be anything on the roof here. Um, this is a one-story drop, which is probably not going to hurt me too bad. So in a pinch, like if this uh, grocery store got surrounded, 
Uh, coming out to this ledge and falling in a direction where there aren't zombies is probably a very safe way of getting away if I don't have ropes set up ahead of time. But um, one of the reasons to live here is there's just this single staircase that ascends to the second floor, meaning that there's only one point of access to get up here, meaning that there's only one point of access that I need to guard, and then subsequently, if I get a sledgehammer, destroy to protect me. Uh, there's also some... This is a coffee maker and uh, some microwave, so I can... Some basic cooking. And because I'm considering living in this building, I want to, and I've never really seen zombies in like toilet stalls, but I want to make sure that I'm alone. Because the last thing you want to do is to wake up to a zombie gnawing on your face. So this also comes with a staff room with a kitchenette and a radio, which I'm gonna grab and set on a counter because one of the trackable things that I have added here is to figure out the emergency broadcast. So at the start of every server, there is a, um, there is a random frequency that, where did I put that? That was weird. There's a random frequency uh, on your radio that will have the emergency broadcast channel. And it's worth knowing that because it will give you weather information and it will also give you the very important for information of whether or not a helicopter is coming, which can ruin your day pretty badly. Um, this radio, however, does not have the emergency broadcast frequency plugged in by default. So this radio is not helpful to me. But that's something to look for is to try to figure out what that broadcast frequency is so that you can listen in and get to know when storms are coming, get to know when the helicopter's coming. And by default, the helicopter only comes once. Um, but the way the helicopter works, it's a meta event, so there's not actually a physical helicopter or anything, but there's a very loud helicopter noise that will follow you around if you're out in the open and draw holy hell swarms of zombies to your location. Uh, so there are kind of two ways to deal with it, which is one, um, if you know the helicopter is coming, to shelter in place so the helicopter can't find you. Because if you're out in the open when the helicopter arrives, it will follow you around. But if you're hiding ahead of time, the helicopter doesn't know where you are and won't hover around you and draw the attention of, of hell upon you. And the second way is to hop in your car and just be moving. Or even being on foot and being moving. Because zombies are pretty slow moving. So as long as you're, um, as long as you're constantly moving, that you won't get bogged down and swarmed. So I just picked up a lighter, which is obviously a useful thing to have for a light of uh, fuel, a fire source, and then scissors, which allows you to do some tailoring. You can cut up clothing and turn them into scraps of fabric to tailor with. The other tailoring items to be found would be a needle and thread. You can get thread through scissors, but uh, without a needle, I can't do tailoring. So the second floor of this area is cleared. And what I can start to do, I'm starting to get drowsy. And what I can start to do is to, for now at least, um, clear out some of these shelves and store things in them. Uh, these, these little filing cabinets don't have very good storage capacity, but I can start working towards moving shelving up here so that I have a high capacity um, storage area in this office space. Um, so things like my canned goods can go here. I would say fresh produce probably needs a refrigerator of sorts, but canned goods can go here and, um, and books and things. And I can actually start marking things down now that I'm like putting them somewhere sem semi-permanent. I'm not going to do any organization yet because I think it's probably smarter for me to have actual proper storage shelves to do organization. But, um, what I will do is I'll mark it down as things I found. So I am moving farming volume one, forage volume one, tailoring volume one, and trapping volume one. So I'm going to mark that down too. And it, personally, I find it useful to have like one book uh, that you want to read on hand at all times. Because um, you never know when you're going to have some downtime. Like when you need a rest or whatever, 
So having a reading material is kind of nice. So I'm going to keep tailoring on me as between farming, foraging, trapping, and tailoring. Tailoring is more of an immediate uh, benefit, whereas the others, farming, foraging, and trapping, foraging you can immediately benefit from, um, but they're kind of like longer term skills that are going to be more relevant in the long run, whereas tailoring could be relevant tomorrow if I found a needle. So I'm going to favorite that so I don't uh, drop it. Um, also, hammer screwdriver can go in my belt loops. That will be better for carry weight and also make them accessible. And then um, the wrench and the saw I'm going to favorite and keep on me because having a wrench and a saw at all times is useful to be able to interact with certain lootables and the like. Same with the scissors. Now, I don't have a lot of sheets to cover up as um, window coverings, but here's the one sheet that I had that I looted. So as you can see, if I start to amass curtains, I can actually block visibility from this little loft of mine so that zombies and helicopters and everything can't really see me here. Thank you for tuning in to Rad's Guide to Project Zomboid, which originally streamed live on Twitch March 28th as a result of a viewer's choice poll. If you have any questions for me, let me know in the comments below, but for this series, I'm not taking feedback. If you would like to join my online gaming community, which is a great place to ask me questions about this game and others, Rodamont.com has a link to it, as does the description of this video. Thank you so very much for tuning in. A big thank you to my Patreon patrons, Twitch subscribers, and viewers like you that support the channel and made it all the way to the credits. I really appreciate it. I hope to catch a next episode or an upcoming stream. Farewell, my fellow zombie slayers.